If you've ever wondered what it'd be like to go through a thrilling chase through the Forgotten Realms, well you're in luck. Let me introduce you to Heist Adventures. Betrayals, twists, villains, rooftop scenes, it's all there. Waterdeep Dragon Heist is a beginner adventure meant for those who yearn for a bit more mystery than your classical dungeon delve. Make no mistake, it has all the elements that makes up a Dungeons & Dragons adventure. It is with the addition of an overarching heist along with the villains that change depending on how the adventure is run that makes this adventure different from others. If you're interested in the story that unfold, follow me as I walk you through the events of the adventure. And with that, let us begin our story of Waterdeep Dragon Heist at the Notorious Yawning Portal. The Yawning Portal, a famous inn and tavern located in the castle ward of Waterdeep. The place is a stone building with a slate roof and several chimneys. It is a building built of multiple floors and is where you find yourself at the beginning of this adventure. You sit around a sturdy wooden table lit by brightly burning candles and littered with plates cleared of food and half-drained tankards. The sounds of gambles yelling and drunken adventurers singing songs nearly drown out the off-key strumming of a young bard three tables over. Then, all the noise is eclipsed by a shout. You pig! Like killing me mates, does ya? Then, a seven-foot-tall half-orc is hit by a wild swinging punch from a male human whose shaved head is covered with the eye-shaped tattoo. Four other humans stand behind him, ready to jump into the fray. The half-orc cracks her knuckles, roars, and leaps at the tattooed figure, but before you can see if blood is drawn, a crowd of spectators clusters around the brawl. Out of interest for the fight, you press through the crowd to find the man is horrendously beaten by the half-orc. Friends of the tattooed man jump into the fray and beats the half-orc unconscious before the innkeeper yells at them to get out. Shouts of alarm suddenly ring out as a hulking creature climbs out of the shaft in the middle of the taproom. A monster with warty green skin, a tangled nest of wiry black hair, a long, carrot-shaped nose, and bloodshot eyes. As it bares its teeth and howls, you can see that a half dozen bat-like creatures are attached to its body with three more circling above it like flies. Everyone in the tavern reacts with fear except for the barkeep, Jernan, who shouts, Troll! You fend off the troll and douse it with fire, putting the monster to rest. Once the troll is dealt with, a man pushes against the tide of patrons, staying clear of the monster to greet you. You be adventurers, am I right? I could use your help. Let's find a table to talk, shall we? The figure who approached you strokes his mustache, adjusts his floppy hat, and tightens his scarf. Volathamp, chronicler, wizard, and celebrity, at your service. I trust you've noted the violence in our fair city these past 10 days. I haven't seen so much blood since my last visit to Baldur's Gate. But now, I fear I've misplaced a friend amid this odious malevolence. My friend's name is Flune Blagmar. He's got more beauty than brains, and I worry he took a bad way home a couple of nights ago and was kidnapped, or worse. If you agree to recover him, I can pay you a hefty sum of gold. May I prevail upon you in my hour of need? You accept the mage's request, and he hands you a bit of gold for doing so. Volo describes Floon as a handsome human male in his early 30s with wavy red blonde hair. He is dressed in princely garb when Volo last saw him. Two nights ago, before Floon disappeared, he and Volo were drinking and merrymaking at the Skewered Dragon, a dark, body tavern in the Dock Ward. Volo recommends that you start your search there. You agree to his request and start your journey to the Skewered Tavern. On the path there, you find yourself on a street that has been cordoned off by the City Watch. Lying on the cobblestones are a half dozen corpses, seemingly the victims of some terrible skirmish. Watch officers have disarmed and arrested three blood-drenched humans and are in the midst of questioning the witnesses. One of the officers sees you. Get on, she says. Nothing to see here. Heeding her advice, you move onto the dock ward in search of Floon. The dock ward has tall, densely packed tenements, leaving most of the neighborhood in shadow at ground level. Most of the street lamps have had their glass smashed and their candles stolen, and the smells of salt air and excrement lingers as you pass by rows of run-down buildings. One nearby shop stands out from the others. It has a deep purple facade, and in its window hangs a stuffed beholder. Above the door stands a sign whose elaborate letters spell out, Old Zoplob's Shop. You decide to enter the shop out of curiosity. A cloud of lavender-scented purple smoke trails out of the shop's door as you peer inside. Every wall is painted purple, and every dusty knick-knack on the shelves is dyed a deep violet. The hairless old gnome sitting cross-legged on the counter wears plum-colored robes. 
The gnome lowers a pipe and exhales a cloud of lavender smoke before raising a hand. Hail and well met. Come browse the shelves of the most curious curiosity shop in the world. You inquire about the disappearance of Floon. The gnome tells you that Floon and a well-dressed fellow of similar appearance were jumped outside the shop by rough-looking men in black leather armor. He thinks there were five attackers, but none of them look familiar. One of them had a black tattoo of a winged snake on his neck. You thank the purple-clad merchant for the information, pay him a few coins, and proceed on your way to the skewered dragon. The skewered dragon looks like a ruin. Both of its front-facing windows are smashed, and a ship's anchor is lodged in the roof. Through the windows, you can see a group of haggard patrons drinking from huge tankards. You mingle with the patrons of the bar and inquire about Floon's disappearance. Several of the regulars remember seeing Volo and Floon drinking together a couple of nights ago. After Volo left, Floon stuck around long enough to meet with another friend, Rene Neverember, the son of Waterdeep's previous open lord, Daggle Neverember. Chip off the old block, that one, sneers one patron. Just another spoiled rich noble who likes to rub our noses in it, says another. Floon and Renair drank and played a few rounds of Three Dragon Ante before leaving around midnight. Five men followed them out, and no one in the tavern knows what happened after that. The men who left shortly after Floon and Renair haven't returned to the tavern since, but they're known to frequent a warehouse on Candle Lane. Look for the snake symbol on the door, says one of the tavern regulars. After gathering enough information from the patrons, you exit the facility and head towards Candle Lane. Once reaching the area of Candle Lane, you find the streets to be a bit darker than other locations in Waterdeep, regardless of the presence of the sun. Gloom envelops a narrow alley as dark as a dungeon and as odorous as one too. Nearly all the street lamps have been smashed. The only light that pierces the darkness is a faint flickering from down the lane, like a distant candle. A warehouse is directly across the street from the lamp, which illuminates a black-winged snake painted above the door's handle. You recognize the symbol belonging to the Zentarum, a shadow network seeking to hold influence and power throughout the lands. This must be the building in which the patrons were referring to. You sneak your way into the building and find the building to be in a rather chaotic state. Tables and chairs have been tossed across the floor. The corpses of a dozen men lie along the walls, their rapiers and daggers lying nearby. Four short avian creatures with long beaks and black feathers look over in surprise from where they stand in the middle of the warehouse. Each wears a hooded cloak and wields a short sword. Some of the humans have a tattoo of a winged snake and others have a tattoo of an unfamiliar symbol. The symbol is a circle with ten spokes radiating out of its circumference. You capture the avian creatures and interrogate them, but they are unable to communicate properly, speaking the words, Xanathar sends his regards, and follow the yellow signs in the sewers in various accents. Further exploring the building, you find a storage room hiding a human male. The man notes that you do not contain any markings that indicate you belong to an organization, and you inform him that you've been tasked by Volo to find Floon. The man sighs in relief and introduces himself as Renair Neverember. He recounts the events that led him to this unfortunate situation. He states, On the night that Floon and I were drinking, I was concerned that Floon was too intoxicated to find his way home by himself and offered to escort him. We were jumped by five thugs with tattoos of a snake as soon as we left. I feel guilty that Floon was taken, since I believe they mistook Floon for me. You ask Renair as to why anyone would want to kidnap him. He lowers his head in shame and replies, The Zentarum thinks that my father embezzled a large amount of gold while he was open lord, and that he hid the gold somewhere in the city. They think that they can find it by using an artifact called the Stone of Galore, which was in the hands of the Xanathar guild until recently. Apparently someone stole it. The Zents thought I knew something about all of this, but I don't. My father and I haven't spoken in years. You offer to bring him along to find Floon, and he gladly agrees, picking up some weapons and armor from the corpses that littered the area. Soon, you hear a loud crash at the door of the building, followed by the clanking of armor and the shout of authority. The city watch has broken into the building and surrounded the entrances and exits, preventing anyone from escaping. A distinguished man stands out from the group and looks over the dead bodies before concluding that this must have been a battle between the Zentarum faction and the Xanathar guild. He approaches you and notes the presence of Renair beside you. The man introduces himself as Captain Staggett and politely inquires as to why you are present here. You tell him of your goal to find Floon, and he nods in agreement. Captain Staggett hands you a piece of parchment containing the laws of Waterdeep, clearly as a reminder of the rules of the city. He heads towards the door before turning back 
and offering some last minute advice to you. Best not to meddle in criminal matters. Leave this dirty business to the city watch. Keep the blood off the streets, okay? Not all city watch officers are as nice as me. And with that, he bids you farewell and leaves. Given time to contemplate on your situation, you ponder on your next step to locating Floon. Recalling the avian creature's word, you decide to enter the sewers of the town in search of the yellow symbols. You make your way to a back alley where you find a circular metal cover on the pavement. Prying the metal cover off, you find a ladder into the sewers and begin climbing down. Renair looks at you with disgust but follows you down, pinching his nose whenever he can. After a bit of climbing, you descend down and land onto the sewer's floor. A putrid stream flows along the sewer's tunnel, which leads in two directions. In one direction, you see a tiny symbol drawn on the wall in yellow chalk, a palm-sized circle of ten equidestant spokes radiating out from its circumference. Deciding to follow the symbols, you find yourself at an entrance of a hideout. You sneak your way into the facility and hear screams of pain and torture. Following the sounds, it takes you down a corridor. Threadbare curtains hang on the east wall of a long hall, in the middle of which, a muscular half-orc in dingy robes stand with his foot on the chest of a male human with wavy red blonde hair. Fire burns around the orc's clenched fist, and his victim cries and squirms helplessly beneath him. Seated on a raised platform to the south is the nightmarish figure wearing black robes. It has large white eyes and rubbery purple skin, with four tentacles circling its inhumane mouth. It cradles and gently caresses what looks like a disembodied brain with feet. Upon seeing you, the creature rises from a stone chair, sets down its pet, and glides across the room, intending to leave through the double door in the west wall. You immediately commence a battle with the orc and save the human from his torture. After the orc's defeat, you heal the human, and he looks at both you and Renair with gratitude. Overcome with emotion, he hugs the both of you and introduces himself as Floon. Having found the missing personnel, you make your way out of the sewer and back to the yawning portal with a particularly foul stench on your body. At the yawning portal, you see Volo drinking alone, clearly anxious about the news of his friend. As soon as Volo spots you, he springs up and rushes over to embrace you, Renair, and Floon. He gives you a rather sheepish look before he explains to you your reward. I confess that I have but few coins to spare, but never let it said that Volo reneges on a promise. Allow me to present something much more valuable. He holds out a scroll tube. The deed to a remarkable property here in Waterdeep! You accept the strange man's reward as the three of them thank you for reuniting them. They offer you their aid if you are ever in need of it, and see you off as you make your way to the address on the scroll to claim your new home. You make your way to the resident to find a large four-story building to claim as your own. Exploring the mansion, you find it to be on the exquisite side, if not a bit creepy. Over time, you clean the manor and make it your own. The streets of Troll Skull Alley become familiar for your face as you become acquainted with the area over the coming weeks. The multiple businesses and community facilities within the area become a part of your daily life and, in turn, you become a part of theirs. News of your heroic rescue of Loon has spread across the town and factions from all over the world have come to recruit you to join them. With joining them, they have various requests for you to complete. Whether you wish to join these factions or not, you must admit that this style of living is a bit dull compared to that of an adventurer. That certainly would be the case, but unfortunately, troubles are about to stir. On an unassuming morning, you are startled awake by the sounds of an explosion. Windows rattle as the roar of an explosion fills Troll Skull Alley. Charred bodies and anguished screams fly through the air. A thick cloud of acrid smoke billows outward from the blast, which seems to have occurred right outside your door. From what you can gather, the sound of the explosion was eerily similar to that of a fireball spell. You open your door and exit your house to find a large gathering of people emerging from their respective houses as well. None of the buildings are ablaze, but multiple people have been killed in the explosion. Murmurs from the crowd fill you in on some details regarding the people who have been killed. Of the many dead bodies, one of them has a black winged snake tattoo, and another body is of a gnome with dry waste on his boots. The tattoo on the man is one that is all too familiar to you. It is the tattoo that represents the Zeterum faction. The dead gnome's boots indicates that he has been in the sewer sometime recently. Along with the gnome's body is a pouch containing a hefty sum of gemstones. After a few minutes pass, the city guards arrive and blocks off Troll Skull Alley. As you are escorted off the crime scene, you overhear talks from the city watch. The gnome was running in the direction of your house and was fleeing from armed pursuers, of which there were three. Only two of the pursuers' bodies were found. 
an old man emerges from the horde of guards and confronts you, noting how the gnomes and Zentarum humans were heading to your house. He is Barnabas Blaswin, and a member of the Watchful Order. Along with him is a member of the city guard, named Sergeant Cromley. They spend a bit of time inquiring about your knowledge of these men. Of course, you know nothing of who they are, and why they come to your house. That answer seems to satisfy them, as it would be illogical to launch such a destructive spell so close to one's home. You offer to aid in the investigation, but they refuse your request. That would introduce too many variables into an already confounding equation, says Barnabas. Cromley adds, trust in the watch. Curiosity getting the better of you, you decide to investigate this on your own. The people around the area seem to be willing to gossip about what they've seen in regards to the event, and it certainly works in your favor. Witnesses report that after the explosion, a man had picked something off the gnome's body and headed towards the bent nail. Others tell you that the figure that hurled the fireball was actually some sort of puppet on the rooftop, bearing striking resemblance to those used by the Temple of Gond. A young boy even found a necklace of fireballs with two beads remaining, clearly being the murder weapon. You make your way to the morgue where you cast a Speak with the Dead spell to pry some information from the deceased souls. When speaking with the soul of the gnome, you learn the gnome's name is Dalakar. He stole an artifact called the Stone of Galore from the lair of a beholder known as Xanathar in a dungeon deep below the city. Dalakar worked for Lord Dagold Neverember and believed the Stone of Galore is the key to finding a hoard of gold hidden in the city. Having heard of your aid to Lord Neverember's son, he was hoping that you'd be able to hold it for safekeeping. With a list of leads to choose from, you decide it is best to confront the Temple of Gon before more murder arises. You head to the House of Inspired Hands where the Temple of Gon resides. The House of Inspired Hands looks like a cross between a temple and a workshop. The symbol of Gond, a tooth cogged with four spokes, is displayed prominently. You see the silhouette of a humanoid shape perching on the rooftop. It extends an arm, releasing a tiny metal sparrow into the sky. The bird does a few loops in the air, then veers right towards you. The bird crashes into you and destroys itself on impact. Looking back up at the roof, the figure is gone. You enter the temple and meet a dragonborn priest of bronze dragon ancestry. She introduces herself as Valetta. How may I be of assistance? She asks earnestly. You inquire about the figure on the roof that had attacked you with the mechanical bird. She breathes a deep sigh and states, That would be Nim, a nimble rite gifted to us by a Lantanese wizard. Follow me and we shall speak with Nim. Going upstairs, you approach a locked door. Valetta seems to be having trouble unlocking the door, claiming the locks must have been switched. Speaking through the door, the two of you convince Nim to unlock the door. After a moment's pause, the sound of clicking is heard before the door swings open. Nim explains that it has been creating a multitude of inventions to curb its loneliness, one of which is another nimble rite that has fled into confusion. Angered by this revelation, Valetta orders that Nim's equipment and inventions are to be confiscated and pleads with you to find the rogue nimble rite. Among the devices found within the room is a strange whirring device. Nim explains that it is a nimble rite detector that begins to spin when activated within 500 feet of a nimble rite. You request that you take this device with you in your hunt, and Valletta agrees. Embarking into the town, you can use the device ward by ward until it alerts you to the presence of a nimble rite in the dock ward. It leads you to three ships, each containing a nimble rite of their own. You question the patrons on the ship about the nimble rite, but they assure you that they are only to be used as entertainment. The owner of the fleet contacts one of the crew members via a sending spell, and invites you to dine with him aboard another ship known as the Eye Catcher. You accept the dinner, and are shuttled by a dingy to a large flagship. The welcome aboard the ship is warmly, and you are led by some humans to a captain's dining area. The dining cabin is decked with golden filigree, the purple curtains festooned with silken tassels, the wood paneling scented with perfume. A magnificent feast laid out on golden platters sprawl atop a mahogany table of exquisite craftsmanship. Standing behind it all, with wine glass in hand, is a well-built, scantily clad man his scarlet apparel designed to accentuate his trim figure and bountiful chest hair. A flashy rapier hangs from his stylish belt. Welcome aboard the Eye Catcher, he says, flashing his pearly white teeth. Zardos Zord at your service. You inquire about the nimble rides aboard his ship, and he assures you that they are completely harmless. As if on cue, a nimble rite holding a decanter enters the dining cabin and quietly refills everybody's wine glass. Zord tells you that the fleet is a seafaring carnival based in Luskin that travels along the Sword Coast. He enjoys visiting the distant island of Lantan about once a year. During his last visit, he purchased four nimble rites from a Lantanese wizard. He keeps two aboard his flagship, and one aboard each of the other two vessels. Everything here seems harmless enough, but you can't help but feel a bit of suspicion towards the man. 
You thank him for the dinner, and insist on heading back to your search, and he politely bids you farewell. Crew members enter the cabin, and escort you back to land, where you are left to figure out what to do. Stumped with the development of your investigation so far, you decide to visit your friend Renair to see what he knows. Finding him drinking at the yawning portal, you approach your friend and share a few drinks together. You inform him about the gnome that has been killed in the chase by the Tuzantarum. His jolly face drops into one of sadness. Renair looks at you and begins a long speech. When the Lords of Waterdeep asked in my father, I thought his long dark shadow was finally gone for good. The truth is, I want nothing to do with him. But his spies hound me. One of them, a gnome named Dalekar, had been watching me for months. Then, about two ten days ago, the spy was suddenly nowhere to be seen. My father didn't trust many people, but he trusted that gnome. I spoke to a few of Dalekar's friends. Apparently he was on a special mission to retrieve the Stone of Galore, and was afraid that the Zentarum and the Xanathar Guild were closing to catch him. When he heard about my kidnapping, he wanted more information about the adventurers who had rescued me. I think Dalekar was planning to pay you to deliver the Stone of Galore to my father in Neverwinter. You inform Renair about the man you had heard that was found fleeing the scene and describe him to Renair. He looks down to his half-finished beer in contemplation before responding. Get some rest for today. I shall talk to some informants of mine and see what I can find. Meet here tomorrow and I will tell you what I learned. It is obvious that his father's shadow has made him weary. You place a hand on his back and bid him farewell for the time being. Exiting the tavern, you find a nearby inn and stay there for a night. When morning breaks, you come back to the yawning portal as instructed. You find yourself a seat, order a beer, and wait patiently for your friend to arrive. After a bit of time at the yawning portal, Rene returns and takes a seat next to you. He informs you that he has learned that the man who fled the scene was a member of the Zentarum named Erstel Floxen. Erstel was spotted entering the Grauhan Villa located in the North Ward. Armed with the new lead, you finish your beer and proceed onwards to the North Ward. Grauhan Villa sits in the middle of an upper-class residential neighborhood in the North Ward. The streets around the villa have pedestrians and coaches traveling along them. Your nimble right detectors alerts you for a bit before dissipating into silence. It seems a nimble right was just here but has fled the scene. You sneak into the Grauhan Villa to find Erstel trying to kick open the door. He notices you and flees almost immediately. You bust open the door that Erstel was trying to open to find a middle-aged man with a rather opulent suit. He cowers in fear, and you demand to know who he is. The man introduces himself as Lord Grauhund. You press the Lord for information, he complies rather easily. It knows the location of a hidden vault in Waterdeep containing a half million gold pieces. House Grauhund has been bankrolling some Tarim operations in Waterdeep, including the plot to kidnap Renair Neverember and the plot to steal the Stone of Galore from his father's gnome spy, Dalekar. His wife was frustrated with the sense and their inability to secure the artifact. She gave a necklace of fireballs to a mechanical servant and sent it out to help retrieve the stone. It was careless and caught the Zents in the fireball by mistake. After learning all that you could from this noble, you tie him up and leave him to be when the City Watch surely arrives. Further in the villa is Lady Grauhund, who has locked herself behind a door with her children. It seems as though the door is magically secured and you are unable to break it down. Examining the mansion a bit closer, you discover a chest containing the red and gold robes of cultists matching the size of adults. It seems as though the Grauhunts belong to a cult, but to which remains a mystery. You exit the mansion in secrecy, and continue your hunt of the Numborite, hoping to obtain the Stone of Galore. Spring, Summer, Autumn, and Winter. With the change in climate comes in change in villains. From here on, your adventure takes many different paths depending on the seasons. While many seem to yearn for the gold contained in Lord Neverember's vault, only one is actively pursuing it. Let us see the adventures unfold with their relative season. Ah, springtime, when beholder eye stalks are in bloom. The Stone of Galore was originally snatched from Xanathar, and the Eye Tyrant wants it back. The stone is delivered to Grinda Garloth, a mage who has worked for Xanathar in the past. When she refuses to give up the stone, members of the Xanathar Guild try to take it by force. You defeat these attackers, and learn that Grinda told her rat familiar to hide the stone in her family's crypt in the City of the Dead. From this point on, you are followed by a gazer through whose eyes Xanathar can see. Losser Merklov, a halfling necromancer, raids the Garloth Mausoleum and takes the stone shortly before you arrive. As you emerge from the mausoleum, members of the Xanathar Guild attacks you, believing you have the stone. A clue left behind in the mausoleum leads you to an old windmill in the southern ward and a pair of grave robbers. Fearing arrest, 
The grave robbers point you to a cellar complex under the trade's ward. When you arrive, you find Lawster surrounded by foes, and Kenku working for the Xanathar Guild, making off with the stone. A chase through the streets on or before Troll Tide ends when the Kenku, fearing capture, duck into an old tower. You capture and confront the Kenkus, who hand over the stone with a bit of persuasion. Attuning yourself to the stone, you learn that the Vault of Dragons lies beneath the theater in the castle ward. As the citizens of Waterdeep contend with sweltering heat, the castle enters, send their disciples of their Asmodeus worshipping cult to seize the Stone of Galore while deftly avoiding entanglements with local authorities. You arrive at the Castle Lantern Mausoleum to find several dead cultists inside wearing the same robes found in the residence of Lord Grawlhund. A Left for Dead survivor reveals that these cultists were betrayed by two of their own. You head to an old windmill in the Southern Ward where the cult fanatics practice their diabolical faith. A Spine Devil swoops in, snatching the stone and flees, giving rise to a rooftop chase. The Spine Devil delivers the stone to a hire coach parked in an alley. Inside the coach is Victoro Castellanter's valet, Williford Crowell, a doppelganger in tiefling form. As the hire coach flees, a street chase ensues. When a crowd cuts off his escape route, Williford leaps out of the hire coach and tries to lose himself in the crowd. In the confusion, street urchins snatch the stone. You catch up to the children in the cellar hideout. With the Stone of Galore in your possession, you emerge from the cellar complex only to find yourself surrounded by members of the City Watch. You are arrested for one or more crimes and taken to a courthouse in the Dock Ward to face sentencing by a magister. Meanwhile, the doppelganger tries to get the stone back. Luckily, you manage to attune yourself to the stone before its confiscation and learn that the Vault of Dragons is hidden under an old tower in the Sea Ward. Convincing the court that your crimes are only but a misunderstanding, you exit the Sea Ward and travel to the tower. You visit the residence of Phanaris Stormcastle, a lamplighter and retired brigand who funnels the information to Brigandar, a drow mercantile group. You arrive to find the place ransacked. The Duergar who looted the residence works for the Xanathar Guild, and Brigand's spies have tracked them to a cellar complex in the Southern Ward. In the guise of Laryl Silverhand, the current open lord of Waterdeep, a drow by the name of Jarlaxle steers you in the direction of the cellar. Deception and misdirection are Jarlaxle's forte, and he likes to trick his rivals into working for him. You've met the man before, but only under the guise of Zardas Zord. A search of the cellar complex yields a fake stone and not the real stone of Golor. With no other leads, you follow up with the false Lairol at a theater in the Dock Ward. Here, Jarlaxle makes you an offer you can't refuse. Once he realizes that the Xanathar Guild doesn't have the stone, Jarlaxle asks you to interrogate Phanaris to find out where he hid it. Jarlaxle has learned that Phanaris is awaiting trial at a courthouse in the Castle Ward. Phanaris wants immunity for all his past crimes. You are in no position to grant him his wish, but you choose to use other unconventional means to get the answers you want. You compel him to reveal the stone's location, and Phanaris points you to an old tower in the Dock Ward. Jarlaxle's lieutenant reaches the stone first and flees across the rooftops in the Dock Ward to escape you. Once you wrest the stone away from these drow, it guides you to the home of a famous painter in the Sea Ward, beneath which is a tunnel that leads to the Vault of Dragons. Now is the winter of Waterdeep's discontent. The Zents who serve Manchun believe their master to be all-powerful, which has made them reckless. Against the backdrop, they're willing to thumb their noses at local authorities and risk death in pursuit of the Stone of Galore. The stone is delivered to Thrakis, a dragonborn butcher in the field ward. Thrakis hides the stone in one of his meat deliveries. You follow the delivery cart to an alley in the trade wards, where the Zents meet in secret. Before you can lay hands on the stone, a Zent named Vavette Blackwater grabs it and flees, initiating a chase across icy rooftops. She hands off the stone to Agorn Fuko, a bard who is attending a play in a nearby theater, before leading you on a merry chase through the snow-covered streets. You learn that the stone has been taken by Hire Coach to Miss Shore, where you are able to intercept Agorn. He is captured and questioned by you, and reveals that he made one stop on his way to Miss Shore. He dropped off a lady friend, a priest of Bane allied with the Zentarum, and left the stone with her and her acolytes for safekeeping. You find them in an old tower at the Castle Ward. Before you leave the old tower, you are confronted by Manchun Simulacrum, which arrives by way of teleportation circle to collect the stone. Once the Simulacrum is defeated, you can use the stone to learn that the entrance to the Vault of Dragon is hidden below a mausoleum in the City of the Dead. 
It has been quite a chase through Waterdeep for the Stone of Galore, but you finally made it to the Vault of Dragons. Along your journey here, you have managed to acquire the keys that should give you access to the vault. When approaching the area, you find a 20 foot high, 20 foot wide stone corridor that ends before an adamantine double door bearing dwarvish runes. The doors have neither handles nor hinges. The writings on them read, the three keys bring them forth. You present the keys you found and the doors part, sliding back in the walls. You step forth into the tunnel and traverse through a small dungeon before finding yourself in the main vault. Although deep underground, this vault is lit by streams of sunlight that pour down from the ceiling, catching motes of dust in their luminous pools. Ornate columns support a 30-foot high vaulted ceiling, which is adorned with carvings of dwarves basking in the presence of their gods. Deep alcoves line the walls, and piled in one of them is a vast golden trove. Out of the dusty gloom steps an aged dwarf clutching a staff carved and painted to resemble a pair of entwined dragons, one red, one gold. Despite the dwarf's age, his eyes are steady and bright. I wasn't expecting anyone, he says plainly. As you can see, the place is a mess. Perhaps you should come back later after I've tidied up a bit. The dwarf is actually the adult gold dragon Aranix in disguise. He guards the gold for Lord Dagult Neverember and holds the dragon staff of Aegaron in exchange for his services. You try to convince the noble dragon that Lord Neverember embezzled the gold from the people of Waterdeep that it would be fair and just to see the coin were safely returned to its rightful owners. Deep down, Aranex knows where the gold came from, but the dragon has allowed his greed and his agreement with Lord Neverember to cloud his moral judgment. Conjuring every persuasive ability you have, you talk to Aranex into allowing the gold to be returned to the people to whom it rightfully belongs. He refuses to give up his gemstones promised to him or the dragon staff, since they are his payment for guarding the gold, however, he is willing to use the staff's power on behalf of the city in exchange for more gemstones. Satisfied with the completed mission, you exit the vault only to be confronted by one last encounter. A horde of enemies await you outside, ready to reap the contents of the vault. You rush back into the vault and alert Aranex of the pursuers, who makes quick work of those who dare steal from the vault. With your foes vanquished, you return back to Waterdeep and alert the current open lord, Laurel Silverhand, of the stolen gold. She thanks you for your service to the city, and allows you to keep one-tenth of the treasure, amounting to 50,000 gold pieces. The large sum of coins in your possession attracts unwanted attention in the form of several people who beg loans or donations from you. In the weeks that follow, words of your deeds spread to every corner of Waterdeep. You enjoy your small fortune from your manor, and the days of thrilling adventures seem to fade away. All is quiet in your world, and the silence seem nearly deafening. One morning, you find a note placed precariously on your doorstep. It reads, Under Mountain Beckons, see you at the Yawning Portal. This adventure shall continue in the events that unfold in Waterdeep, Dungeon of the Mad Mage. Hello everybody! I hope you enjoyed the story of Waterdeep Dragon Heist. This one was a request in uh, one of the previous videos. Uh, they left a comment asking if I could do this one, and uh, it was an adventure I didn't have yet, so I was like, yeah, I'll go out and buy it. Um, I like reading them, so it's a fun read. Uh, I have quite a few more videos that I'd like to make. Uh, if you have any requests for adventures, just let me know, and uh, please do be patient. Uh, these take a bit of time to make with the uh, recording and editing and all that. Yeah, you get it. Um, if you enjoyed the video, I'd really appreciate a like and subscribe. They really help me out. Uh, and yeah, thanks!